Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the last two days of action at the Oslo Esports Cup, the first ever tournament of its kind where they put eight very strong grandmasters in a room together, but they played chess on computers and not live over the board. Very interesting. They can have headphones in, they can listen to music, they have a sushi bar right there. I mean, honestly, it sounds like a great experience. Might make me just get the title for that purpose on my own, not that I would get invited to the tournament, but... We had a lot of drama in the last two rounds, and in this video, I'm going to take you through that drama. Uh, first, we are going to start with the penultimate round, round number six. Uh, we're going to kind of breeze through it, not extremely important. Um, and then, obviously, there's a lot of games in the last day, so it's eight players. Uh, remember, they obviously play seven rounds. Uh, every head-to-head -head matchup is uh, best of four, so four rapid games and maybe a blitz playoff to decide it. Uh, Prague versus Duda was a very important matchup because it was first and second place, and they were... Um, they were separated by just one point, which there's an eligible three. Now, this is the second game. Prague is already down 1-0, uh, and Duda goes for a Grunfeld defense. Now, we saw Prague play um, play a very interesting sideline with Queen A4 check against Eric Hansen. Do you remember that? No, that's absolutely fine. Doesn't really matter. Um, in this game, Prague goes for a Bishop C4, Knight E2, uh, other main line. This is like an ultra, ultra, ultra main line nowadays. And here, Black generally will choose whether to set up with Knight C6, B6, Queen A5, E6, whatever. Bishop G4 here also looks kind of logical, but after F3, you just sort of get booted, which is actually why White Knight, the White Knight is on E2 and not on F3, just so you understand. That's, that's actually exactly why it's there. Um, in this game, Duda j does in fact choose the knight c6, e6 setup, and Prague grabs the pawn on c5, and while Duda is out trying to get the pawns back with the queen, uh, Prague begins a slow transfer of the pieces to the king side, right? So he puts the pawn out to f4, the knight out to g3, and maybe he's going to start creating some attacking possibilities. But the Grunfeld is a very, 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 the video's not broken, I'm just trying to make a point, very, very resilient opening. Just because you set up an attack against it, you could set up five attacks against it, it doesn't really matter. The Grunfeld will absolutely never go away. Um, and um, you can have a very strange setup of pieces, but uh, you somehow always have enough defensive measures in place and enough kind of tactical continuations that your position never falls apart. Uh, and to be honest, a little bit later, it was Duda himself playing the move f5, pushing a pawn in front of his king, which is sort of brave. Like, look at this position. The king just has four pawns in front of him and nothing else. And yet he's completely fine. Prog continues to try to attack with his rook and here sacrifices his c-pawn with the intention of throwing kind of a, a wrench in the wheels of the black position and creating some sort of attack. And he, he, really, he did it. I mean, Prog is right there. But king f7 by Duda, ultra resilient move. And here Prog had to play rook e1. The problem with rook e1 is that, I mean, it just, first of all, it looks absurd to play because you just completely give away this bishop, but there's a draw opportunity in there with rook back to e7 and then maybe some sort of repetition. Instead of that, what Prog does is try to keep the pieces on the board. The problem is Duda is one of the best defenders currently in the game. Uh, he's up two pawns. He hides his king on the edge of the board and turns out at the end of the day, it is Prog who is struck with rook to e2, cannot take it because of a fork. Rook is coming to g2. And uh, the white king just absolutely collapses. You cannot take the rook again because of the fork. So Duda shook up the standings uh, in the penultimate round, in round number six, by defeating Prague. And uh, it, was, um, it was another matchup uh, in the penultimate round. It was Magnus versus uh, Eric Hansen. And by the way, this one, shockingly, also a Grunfeld defense. Uh, and now, this, this is interesting, Magnus copies Prague. Magnus plays the exact same line that he play, that Prague played against Hansen. Um, you know, what's interesting about this is that basically Magnus must have seen a weakness, uh, and he must have also anticipated that Eric wouldn't expect this. Like, if, if a guy just played something against you, you're obviously going to go back and, like, work on everything and fill in the gaps. You don't expect the next guy to go directly into the same thing, because... It's the freshest thing in your mind. And Magnus is like, I don't care. I'm the goat. I do what I want. <laughs> so he plays it in a slightly different way. You'll notice that in the other game, I think Hansen played a very early B5. Uh, I think this happens a little later this time. And then the position is, I think, just a little bit mildly different. Uh, Magnus trades some pieces. So we have a bishop swap and then a swap of bishop for knight. 
Uh, I actually mentioned giving away this dark scored bishop in, in my last recap. Uh, of that game between Hansen and, and, and Prague. Uh, and Magnus just has the following position. And basically what Magnus is saying is like, look, my bishop is gonna go here and harass you. Your knight is nice, but really serves no other purpose than being nice. It looks pretty, but that's about it. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch my pawns at your king because you've gotten rid of your bishop. The engine might be able to defend it, but you're not the engine, right? So uh, there's h4. Right? Um, Hansen tries to fight back with e5. There's bishop h6. Right? Queen is coming in. Now rook lift. So Magnus actually is worse here, which is the craziest thing. Like Magnus is playing a bunch of natural moves and Stockfish hates what he's doing. Stockfish here is claiming it's minus 0.6. It just does not think white has any attack. But he's the goat. He doesn't care what Stockfish has to say. And then he plays the move f4 and suddenly everything is back in his favor. I think where Hansen went wrong, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, I mean, you know, computer wants to open up the center. Uh, and try to fight back against the pawns. The problem is that the longer the center stays closed, the more maneuvering you do, the more time white has to build up another break. Now, if you try to open the center, uh, I play f5. So I have a new, you know, player two has entered the arena here. Uh, King h8 is coming. And uh, yeah, I mean, Magnus just swarms. I mean, his na now, can we just address something, folks? Remember a while ago, black resigned here because of check and queen g3, queen g7. This knight literally did nothing. Can we just... Can we just acknowledge that? That knight, go back to the beginning of the game, that knight literally moved to d7, b6, and c4, and stood around as the black village of the king was absolutely ravaged. <laughs> that knight, that knight, <laughs> the knight fell asleep in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, on the grass. It was like, oh, whatever, I don't, uh, I, I took my little walk, I'm gonna fall asleep, I don't really care. And then the rest of the pieces, blah, 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 you know, just got obliterated. So Magnus made a uh, quick work uh, of Hansen in this in this game, um, but uh, I think I think he won two and a half uh, to half. I mean it's tough, right? This, playing against Magnus with Black, not easy. Um, and uh, so he defeats uh, Hansen and uh, Duda defeats Prague. So huge shakeup in the standings. He also got Le Quang Liam uh, pulling up. Uh, yeah, you guys don't want to go anywhere. Honestly, this was a completely insane uh, final day of action. So first of all, how is Duda going to do against Hansen? Poor Hansen. I mean, the dude has to end the event playing Magnus and Duda. Like, the two top guys. Like, really? Why couldn't he get it over with in the first few days? This game was absolutely insane. So Duda plays a Berlin, right? So he's, he's trying to be solid. He doesn't want to lose this game. Uh, an anti Berlin. So Hansen's like, I'm not interested in no end game. Uh, Bishop c5. And here the main line is to take. I mean, really, that's to take. And, uh, and, uh, but, but Hansen plays a sideline, which is c3. Uh, and Duda attacks the center right away with d5. Very provocative move. Why? Because the queen's out. I mean, that's the queen's going to get kicked around, and knight d2 is possible. Queen e2, solid move by Hansen. And the thing is, like, normally in these positions, you, you just get a lot of space, and then you can even, like, target the queen again. It's just, a, like I said, it's a provocative opening by black. Um, so knight g5, knight e4. And Hansen gets a really nice-looking position here. Like, uh, it, it, I mean, it just seems like he's just gonna play h5, h6. You know what's funny, though, is that after rook 88, Stockfish says minus 1.2, and that, that's only if white plays the only move, which is this. Uh, otherwise, it's minus 2, just the game is over. Which is crazy, because this looks so nice. I was looking at this game, I'm like, oh, look at that, Hansen's attacking! That looks really nice for him. Nope, terrible. Stockfish is like, you're trash. Um, point is that there's actually no real attack, and, and Black just has very real pressure on this pawn on d3, but that is nowhere near the end of the story. So Hansen goes here, takes, takes, Duda makes, uh, makes a getaway score for his bishop, uh, and now Hansen goes pawn gobbling. So he takes the pawn on a7, right? Then he takes the pawn on b7. So now Hansen is just cleanly up two pawns. The evaluation of this position, however, after knight to f4 is minus six. Yeah. The point is that after takes takes, uh, white just hasn't really done anything to save his position. Like the king hasn't castled, the knights can't even guard one another because if you play the move knight to f1, I mean I'm, I'm gonna go this way. When have you ever seen in a middle game a rook can just attack a king? The whole back rank is completely cleared out. So yeah, I guess Eric just misplayed in the opening here um, and then was like, well, you know what, screw it, I'm just gonna go take a couple of pawns and see what happens. Uh, so he has to actually part ways with his knight. He does have three pawns for it. The problem with those three pawns, and even though he's won the entire queen side of black, he hasn't castled. 
and the move here was prevented, uh, was played in order to prevent him from ever castling. You cannot castle through check. So uh, the king is stranded in the center of the board and it's about to get real ugly. Queen a1 and rook e8 and uh, yeah, Duda wins. I mean, he just, what a game. Uh, I mean, whoever said the Berlin has to be boring. Well, to be honest, it, 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 the, this actually it has nothing to do with the Berlin. Uh, White played an anti-Berlin. Um, so it, actually anti-Berlin positions can get very complicated as you can see in this game. So, I mean, yeah, Duda plays a super aggressive variation where I think White just has to be super well prepared. Like probably you have to play B4, A4 to try to take advantage of black uh, wasting time here in the opening. I don't know the theory here. I just imagine that you probably have to know the theory. Otherwise, uh, this is just, you know, you're letting black get away with playing a super aggressive variation and uh, well, we see what happens. I mean, my man just absolutely just steamroller. So Duda wins his last two matches, and he's awaiting Magnus, he's awaiting Prague, he's awaiting Liam. Let's see what happens in their matches as Duda has a, a, a very, 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 very strong score. Uh, Prague is up against Anish in the final round. Now, Anish is, is, is second from the bottom, actually. He's having a rough event low-key. I mean, like, Eric, Eric Hansen is... Uh, is struggling, but he is, um, like, Hansen, I think, is a mid-26, I think he's, like, 26-40, 26-50, so it's forgivable. You're, like, you know, you're in a field of killers. It's it's not, like, the craziest thing in the world. Anish is top 10 in the world, not in Rapid, or maybe in Rapid, but in Classical, so you look at Anish, you're, like, dude, I'm expecting some dubs, right? So, um, Prague goes after Anish's, uh, King's Indian defense. We have an ultra main line. I mean, millions of games have been played here. Um, but Anish plays an orthodox variation, so he develops the bishop to g4, which is not the most common way of playing this position. The point is that, uh, and to, by the way, I recommend to beginner, intermediate, even like 2,000, 2,200 players, uh, this bishop g4 kings Indians are so easy to play. Very easy game plan. Uh, take knight when attacked, and then move king, bring knights back, and play f5. And that is exactly what Anish does in this game. Like, to me, this is the easiest King's Indian to learn because you just trade your bishop and then white doesn't... Like, people are very bad at playing closed positions. By the way, look at bishop h6. That is actually a... You could play this right now. And uh, Anish... I, I don't think Anish blundered this pawn. I mean, uh, this, this must be theory of some sort. Um, the point is that black just sacks a pawn. And black now has incredible dominant center control. Uh, the knights are just going to come in. E4, F4, F3. This queen is absolutely beautifully positioned. Horrible situation for white. Honestly, just terrible. F4, you try to block. I'm coming in with the knight. And Prague tries to, like, plug the hole here, just giving you the bishop and defending it with two pawns. But it doesn't matter because the knights are still incredibly strong. You don't want to trade queens if you're attacking. And, uh, I mean, look at Anisha's army. Now, to his credit, Prague is doing what you kind of are supposed to do in the King's Indians, which is wreck them on the queen side. But uh, it's too slow. And, uh, well, I, I, it's too slow if you take the bishop. But even if you get in, like you take on d6, I mean, black's attack is so powerful. Look at rook f6, e4 is coming. Um, and I think e4 must happen at some point. Uh, rook h6, you can't even take because mate. So Prague is just dancing around Anish's attack here as Anish now fires off on the other side of the board. And uh, the knight is traded. Although I have to tell you, knight g3 looks a little bit more appealing. Um, but Anish just decides. Anish is not fixated upon checkmate. You can use your attack to get a winning advantage. You don't need to deliver mate. So he takes g4, a uh, little bit of tactics here, um, but the attack is, I mean, white's got some nasty stuff, you know, brewing as well, but black defends everything. And uh, like I said, here comes f3. He knows how to transition the game from a winning uh, checkmating attack to potentially a winning end game. And I think it was smooth sailing. I mean, Prague tried to create some counterplay. Anisha's king has to boldly walk out to h5, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, black is two pawns up and white is completely restricted. And uh, yeah, I mean, there we go. F pawn is dominant. King walks to the middle and uh, you're just going to take everything. So Prague ends up going down on the last two days of the event. Actually, Anish picks up a win against them and does Duda. So Prague ran out of steam. I mean, he started as the world ender. This man was knocking these top 10 dudes out in three games in Rapid. But I think every match Prague lost, he lost also in three games. So crazy. I mean, what, what, what a, I mean, that man likes to fight. All right. So we got to give him credit. Uh, he unfortunately slows down a little bit. He is now no longer eligible to win the event. 
after going down against Magnus, Duda, and the Niche. Um, but uh, he's still obviously around the top. Uh, the next game that I have for you is Liam. Liam, man, this dude is a beast. Like, you gotta put some respect on this man's name. This is his game against uh, Jordan. If he wins this game, this is the Blitz playoff. If he wins this game, he's top one, top two. He's right there as well. Um, and this game, this game uh, did not disappoint. I mean, he he showed up to to play. Uh, Jordan plays an open Slav, so this is a Slav defense. Black can obviously keep it closed with a semi or take on c4, more of an open Slav. And Jordan plays this c5 variation. It's a bit of a sideline, uh, but the point is that you know Black just develops in a slightly passive manner, and we have some pawn tension here. So Liam is going to have to win a position with completely symmetrical pawns. Both c and d pawns have completely vanished from the board. So, b3, queen e7, how is, how, how, how is Liam going to do this? Well, first he trades the knight, right? Takes, takes. Visually speaking, this looks really nice for white, right? I mean, like, you got knight g5 opportunities, queen is coming to g4. Turns out, just for, like the motto of this video, Stockfish hates this. It thinks that after knight a5, white is forced to retreat the bishop, has to sacrifice the b-pawn, and just goes right back. And now, and now black is just a pawn up. Um, that, I mean, this is, again, we're talking Stockfish. Uh, in the game, Jordan doesn't play that. He plays bishop back to e8, trying to trade some rooks. And Liam here just, at, just sees an open highway on a flat road and hits the gas. All right, my man goes queen g4, g6, knight g5. Now here he has to slow down, otherwise, you know, he's gonna fly off the highway. So he goes queen g3, otherwise he loses the queen. And then he just, he doesn't trade and f4, and he's just gunning it. The bishops, the knight, the queen, now the rook. This is this is advanced chess. How do you get the rook in the game with for white without moving it? f4, now the rook is playing because rook f3 is a possibility in the future, and f5, not right away you're gonna lose your queen, that's what you guys would play, but keep this f5 move in mind. Bishop a3, of course he's like, I'm not trading, even though my bishop is on the corner. This is a, a, an example, by the way, of why bishops are better than knights, I mean, a knight can't do this. A bishop can stand and see literally the whole board. Like the bishop is standing on a mountaintop and looking with binoculars and the, the bishop sees everything, right? Uh, not this bishop. That bishop, yeah, that's, that, that, that bishop needs cataract surgery. Uh, knight b8 and now here comes f5 and uh, this is how you conduct an attack. Every single piece of white is playing. The rook is getting involved with the pawn moving. And the game ends in a most spectacular of fashions as Jordan attacks Liam's queen with the move bishop to d6 and he just completely ignores it. I mean, he just completely ignores it. And this move must have come as an absolute shocker uh, to Jordan because here the best move is still to take the queen. The point is that ef7 is a check and after bishop f7, bishop f7, king f8, this is checkmate. <laughs> put that on the board uh but you have to sack the queen back and maybe what was missed here it, i don't know like knight f7 rook d7 the game's actually not over um knight h8 can i mean look at this this is hanging bishop d6 knight g6 maybe jordan didn't want to defend an endgame down two pawns that's kind of reasonable i mean i don't know i didn't talk to him uh jordan decided not to not not to fall victim to some sort of you know you know like in basketball when a guy's gonna dunk and like you could stand under him and you could be turned into a highlight reel or you could just move out of the way. So Jordan decides to move out of the way. The problem is he dunks anyway. Or, I mean, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what happened here. I don't know if that was a mouse slip. Like maybe he was trying to play f5. f5 seems a bit more reasonable, right? Because then there is no bishop f6. Although actually there still is because there's e7 check. So I don't know. I actually matter. Maybe he mouse. I don't know. I have no clue. But anyway... Liam sacrifices his queen, doesn't get to actually pull off the entire combination, uh, but Jordan, uh, yeah, I mean, what a beautiful attack. Like, let's just go back a few moves. Like, this is a game you study for how to conduct an attack. Trade a defender, rotate your pieces that way, stay patient, and then just launch a pawn, and that pawn wreck it Ralphed the black position. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Liam wins. And now, folks, we await the GOAT. Will Magnus Carlsen take care of Shakriar Mamidyarov in the Rapid? If, 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 if uh, Magnus wins in the four games of the Rapid, he wins the whole thing because he gets three points. However, if he goes to the Blitz, uh, he only gets two points or one point, and then he would not win. I think he would lose on tie breaks. So Magnus plays uh, c4. Mamidyarov plays this provocative English with bishop b4, and then he just goes back. It's some stupid line. Don't worry about it. Uh, 
Magnus plays d4 and now grabs the bishop. So he has the bishop pair. The players develop their pieces and both castle. c5. c5 is a big decision because now this knight is going to move. And really, black has to achieve this. Uh, if black never achieves the move d5, like uh, I'm going to make a bunch of stupid moves, please excuse me. If for some reason this becomes the position, uh, white is positionally winning. Just completely positionally winning. Because black has what's called a backwards pawn. A backwards pawn is a pawn that cannot come forward because the enemy controls it completely. But also this pawn is not guarded by any pawns. So this is not a backwards pawn. But this is because it's not protected by pawns and it cannot move forward really. The square in front of it is totally dominated. So Mamidiara very quickly plays d5. He takes care of his bad pawn, uh, takes takes. And uh, again, obviously still some development going on. Very, very interesting position. Magnus has what they call the bishop pair, but it doesn't really matter because they don't do anything. Like, you're not going to go here and go, well, I have the bishop pair because then the guy's going to attack your queen. Magnus doesn't have a whole lot of development, so he's got he's to make the right trades. He trades the bishop, and a couple moves later, Mamidyarov takes on c3. And to be honest with you, Shaq has won this, this opening battle. I mean, it's been 20 moves, but... Black has absolutely no weaknesses. Very good development. How is Magnus going to possibly win this game? Well, he's Magnus. You got to trust the endgame goat, right? So we have a trade. Rook d1, rook d6. I now tra- Okay, I'm not going to lie. I got to trust the endgame goat, but I'm not exactly sure how he's going to win this. At the end of the day, he has split queenside pawns versus an intact structure. And this is what we call a queenside majority. So queenside majority is a three on two or a two on one, which in the long run is going to become a one on zero. And that defending side is going to have to make sure that the pawn doesn't get through, right? So g3, a6, and uh, c4. So Magnus is not allowing it to move forward. But Shaq is, I mean, putting the knight back, trying to reroute it, gets the knight to f6. Okay. I know it's not fair to say, but I think we, at some point, need to, like, not... Like, what are we doing here? What, why, is this, why am I even showing this game? Well, the endgame goat is going to work as magic, right? He's going to play, you know, we're going to f3, connect 4. Not on the first rank, not on the first starting rank, right? King e6, knight back. Uh, and a5, wow. Magnus, Magnus really wants to win the damn game. Um, look at that move. So the point of that move is that if you take, then I can check here and win a second pawn, right? That, I mean, or, and if I don't win a second pawn, I can maybe check and win this second pawn, or I can, you know, I can even go back. And the point is that you're not going anywhere. My, 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 my pawn and my knight create a little barrier here so your king can't get close. Hashtag Chael Sonnen. Right, so the problem with the move a5 is that it's actually a bit of a catastrophic failure. Huh? Knight c7, e4, knight e6, while Shach gets to c5 first. And... Magnus cannot allow an outside pass pawn because that loses in all endgames, basically. Because what ends up happening is this pawn is a permanent decoy. Uh, and I can throw it forward and then get in. And I have, not only that, I even have backup. So your king cannot leave too far. If your king tries to run after me, first of all, I'm going to eat everything. I'm, it's going to be the wolf in the, you know, the wolf in the hen's house or whatever. But also this, like you, you just can't even follow me. So... I don't exactly know what happened here. Uh, maybe Magnus thought he had some e5. Uh, but the problem is that now Shock is playing for a win. Shock just absolutely turned the tables on the endgame goat. The pawn's on a3. The knight for white now is permanently stuck defending it. And it's even worse. The worst part is that knight a4 is always a possibility. So, for example, like, this can happen later on. And you're just going to get deflected off the promotion. So, knight e6 back. Magnus is just, I mean, he's still gunning for this win. But how? His knight is stuck. He's still gunning for the win. But how? His knight is stuck. And suddenly, you, you see here Magnus start repeating. And Shock must go, wait a minute, a5? And at this point, Shock is flipping the whole script. He's like, bro, I'm going to win this game. I'm going to go back to d7 and get the pawns. Now, Stockfish still thinks this is a draw, but that's why you don't analyze games with Stockfish. You analyze games the way they're going on. This is an insane game. Every pawn for white is about to fall down. But white is still maybe going to get to d6 and f7. So... Knight g3, we still see the value of the outside passers as they completely hold the white king hostage. Knight to d2, knight c4, knight, uh, king e6. And here come the pawns. They are all going to fall one by one. 
A4 check, they're holding the king hostage. The king is being held hostage. And, and there we go. Shock doesn't even need to take the pawn on h4. He just plays f4 and f3. And the pawns completely win the game for black. Shakri Armamidyarov has shocked the world, surviving for a while until Magnus overextends and gets a win. Usually Magnus breaks over that, you know, but, but no, not in this game. The point is that you can't take the knight because even though the, this is protected, the pawns are too far. The knight can't guard two pawns, right? So this game was literally lost. Not really, but it was... The only opportunities for black were when Magnus, Magnus played the move A5. Like, he didn't have to do that. He could have just chilled, brought his king, okay, whatever. But he forced the action to get a win, and now he's in big trouble, but he's Magnus. He's Magnus. He's got one more chance. He's got the game with the black pieces, and he plays a very interesting King's Indian with a very early C5. Uh, but you're, you can take now. So this is the difference, is that Shock tries to play like a Fianchetto thing, now, the interesting thing is that as obscure as this opening looks, and yes, that is a hanging pawn, uh, they've played this before. There was a game, Mamidyarov Carlson, September 26, 2021. I didn't remember that off the top of my head. Don't think I'm some crazy person. I saw that in the database. And in that game, Magnus played the move Queen C4 and got pancaked, uh, which means he lost. Even though pancakes are nice, it's not good to get pancaked in chess. Uh, but it's fascinating that he went back to it. So Magnus doesn't even play Queen C4. He goes back to the same line where he lost once. And, um, yeah, this game was a totally different story. So now Magnus is, uh, you know, he's trying to create attacking chances. He's not letting Mamidyarov castle. Mamidyarov is like, well, I don't need to castle. G4. You don't want me to castle? All right, I won't. Fine. And, 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 uh, and Magnus is like, okay, H5. Okay, G5. Knight D5. Queen goes back to D8. Knight D4. I'm not going to castle. I mean, if I'm going to castle, it's going to be way later, Magnus. Don't, don't worry about it. You, you don't want me to castle? It's like, all right, be careful what you fish for. All right? Knight c5. Knight c6 takes knight back to b4. And Mami Diarov just has good pressure on the c6 square. But the thing is, we always got to believe in Magnus, you know? It's like when your favorite football club is down 3-0 in Champions League. Queen c7, bishop c6, rook b8. You somehow just believe in them, you know? But who are we believing in? Mami Diarov is just up a pawn. There are big weaknesses all over the place. And you're just going to go bishop d4 at some point. Just trade the pieces. So queen a7. And now he castles. We have a trade in the middle. Cd5. Activating the rook. Right? Rook b4. Rook c2. Just slowly improving. Rook c1. Rook c4. I mean, listen. You're up a pawn. What are you going to do? You're going to trade the pieces. This is crazy. Magnus is on the verge of not only not winning this match in the rapid portion. He's on the verge of losing this match. So queen b6. Takes takes. And uh, Shach just slowly consolidates his position and creates some threats. He's threatening a draw. He's threatening a draw. He's not actually going to do the draw. Plays king g2. Takes the knight. And uh-oh. Uh uh-oh. 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 There's a getaway pawn. Someone's got to stop it. Magnus just sacrifices an exchange here. I mean, what an absolutely absurd day of chess. Uh, and Shach just cleans up. I mean, he gets the rook down. Rotates the queen, and you, you can't stop mate. Levy, yes you can! Queen b3 stops mate! No, there's another mate. Doesn't matter how many checks you can give, I just hide my king. Queen f3, and Shock just beat Magnus in three games. Two and a half out of three. And that, I mean, that changes everything. Goodbye to Magnus's chances of winning this thing. The final standings are Jan Krzysztof Duda... Winning the entire uh, event with a possible 14 points. He gets 14 out of 21, because obviously there's seven matches. You have three eligible points. So he gets seven points. Uh, sorry, um, 14 points out of 21. Liam! Le Quang Liam of Vietnam and St. Louis. Uh, 13 points. Second place. Magnus and Prague tie for third. And then it's Shakri Armamidyara with 11. And Jordan with 10. I mean, it's crazy. One point separates everybody. Magnus with nine. Hansen a bit rough. Uh, but uh, listen, I'm sure it was a huge experience for him. And uh, hopefully he, you know, was not discouraged whatsoever. It's always fun to have uh, Chesbra playing. Um, but yeah, Duda is the champion of the first major, which is incredible. So congratulations to Jan Krzysztof. Uh, Polska Gurom, as they say. Uh, congrats also to Liam.
And yeah, it's insane. Magnus, uh, Magnus and Prague both uh, flaming out toward the end. So um, we'll see if Magnus can bounce back. We'll see how much Prague learns from all this. And uh, the first major of the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour is in the books. I hope you enjoyed the recap. Hope you had fun. Peace out. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.